What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the showmefootball.com podcast. I am your host, Josh Finn. And as always, I am joined by Connor. And we're here to review Kentucky versus Mizzou. So, uh, game just finished not too long ago, as everyone knows. Missouri fell to the Kentucky Wildcats 35-28. to And there's a lot to talk about from this game. I mean, there's a lot to talk about from every game. But, I mean, there's so many different ways we can go. And really, we could start from anywhere. But uh, I guess people like it when I always ask you your initial thoughts, Connor. So why don't you kick it off with your initial thoughts on this game? Do you get a lot of feedback on the show? Like, Just give me your initial thoughts on the game. Uh, initial thoughts, it was pathetic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the defense at times looked like the 2018 Chiefs. And the entire game was a headache. There were some moments that gave me hope and excitement. Uh, I told you earlier that I made an inhuman sound when Blaze Aldridge uh, blocked the field goal. Yeah. And there were a couple other uh, moments that got me really excited. But if you take those moments away, the game was utterly pathetic. And it's amazing that the game was as close as it was. You know, I can't really disagree with that. And it is amazing that it was a as close as it was because it seemed like we were getting our ass beat and we were uh especially in the, that first half there and at one point it looked like it was about to become uh like what 27 to 7 or no i'm sorry 24 to 7 or something like that if i'm correct uh if i have the timeline correct uh but it, it was looking pretty bad and then all of a sudden Defensive back J.C. Carlis gives us hope and forces a fumble out of the hands of Chris Rodriguez, the Kentucky running back, in the end zone. Mizzou recovers, and then they you know, execute this two-minute drill perfectly down the field and score to make it a one-score game going into half, and you felt really good. And they continued that kind of same pace into the second half where the defense was getting – you know, ran over a lot still, and they were giving up a lot of big plays and they struggled to get a lot of stops. But when the offense got the ball back, they were kind of doing the same thing to Kentucky. They would slowly chip away and then they, you know, end the drive with a touchdown uh, most of the time, it seemed like. But uh, it got to a point where the incompetence of the defense just became too much for Mizzou to overcome. Uh, and we'll start with that. Uh, Mizzou, they gave up 520 yards of total offense, the Wildcats, 179 through the air, but 341 on the ground, just bad, bad, bad. And we knew that Mizzou's rush defense was a problem coming into this game based off their performance at CMU. But man, they definitely did not improve. Uh, Kentucky averaged seven and a half yards per play on offense. And uh, you're you're just not going to win with that. Well, I'm surprised they didn't just run the ball the entire game. Like, the only time that we ever stopped them was a lucky fumble or interception in the first half. And then in the second half, we got them a couple times with the pass defense, but we never really did anything significant to stop the run. So if they would have just ran the ball the entire game, it probably would have been a blowout because our defense was pathetic in every sense of the word. It really was. and. Really, again, the secondary, they had some good moments, but it all gets overshadowed by how bad the defensive uh, front seven was. Uh, I mean, it, and I've already seen people uh, start to turn on Steve Wilkes, and uh, I we talked about it off or when we before we started recording. Sorry. Uh, that a lot of fans I've seen on Twitter and on Power Mizzou were already starting to turn on Steve Wilkes. And I'm like, guys, come on. Um, you know, we cannot just continue this revolving door of defensive coordinators coming to Mizzou. And then every time the defense doesn't improve, say, oh my God, we need to fire the defensive coordinator. You also have to acknowledge that uh, no defensive coordinator in America is going to be able to scheme around horrible talent. 
And that's where Mizzou is right now. They don't have talent on defense. You have to be able to recruit SEC level talent on the defensive side of the ball. And Mizzou just hasn't yet. They're getting there with drink wits. I, I, I mean, we, they've had, you know, some really good commitments uh, that they picked up in the 22 class, even uh, one of them, uh, that fans should be excited about this is Xavier Simmons, the linebacker. They flipped from Virginia Tech, the four stars. So, I mean, it will get to a point, but they're just not there yet. And to say that Wilkes isn't the answer, game two of his first year and Drinkwitz's second year, when they're still trying to build this program, it's just unfair. And it just shows that you don't know football. And that's just not how it works. We're still recovering from the days of horrible Barry Odom recruiting. And I don't mean to talk bad about the Missouri defense too much because they have some players. They just don't have enough of them. And it sucks because a lot of these players that have performed really well, their performances get overshadowed by just really, uh, there's no other way to say it, the incompetence of the rest of the defense. Well, I was telling you, uh, I think it was, what, during halftime of the game, Bill Belichick wouldn't make Ish Burdine a good football player. Like, Ish Burdine is objectively a poor football player, and it doesn't matter if it's Belichick, Saban, Bill Parcells, none of them are going to make him look good. And so you shouldn't be expecting Steve Wilkes to just come in and magically turn the scrubs on this defense into competent football players. He can uh, change his scheme so that they're better, but that's about all he can do. Uh, This defense isn't going to look great until he gets at least one recruiting class in. Like These are still Ryan Walters guys on defense. These aren't Steve Wilkes guys. So... I'm not tripping about Steve Wilkes right now, but man, this defense is just, just want, poor. Sorry to cut you off, but I just want people to answer. What do you want Steve Wilkes to do? Honestly, what can he p- possibly do to scheme around the lack of talent here? There, you can't you can't say make adjustments. Steve Wilkes has made adjustments, guys. I mean, he he's ran a great mix of zone and man coverage, and he's done. He he's shown a bunch of different looks. Uh, on the in the with the front seven and trying to defend the run. I mean, he's bringing all kinds of guys down to the line of scrimmage. There, there's nothing more he can do. Yeah, um, I don't <laughs> see how you blame him because, like, the defense looked better in the second half than it did in the first half. He made adjustments. The defense got better, but it still sucks. Like, and it's just a talent thing. We talked about all the time last year about how there were situations where we just did not have the guys to win the game or stop the run or anything like that. And it still remains fairly true. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Mizzou defense, we know they've struggled for the past few years. Um, Drinkwitz and now Wilkes, they've been dealt a bad hand. And it, it, it's not something that can be fixed overnight. Um, this team lost a lot of talent too. Tyree Gillespie, Josh Bledsoe, Nick Bolton. It's those guys are not that easily replaceable. My one criticism of Wilkes is that Burdine and Rakestraw were the starting corners when the boys from Tulsa were doing good last week. I don't know how you can put them out there, especially Burdine after the performance we saw from Caleb Evans last week. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, and again, tonight, you know, they went hard after these Tulsa corners and uh, both of them, both of them, excuse me, were seen as NFL prospects uh, coming to Mizzou. So um, the fact that they're not being favored over some of these other guys is a little bit questionable. I don't think any NFL team is salivating at the idea of drafting Ishmael Burdine. No, I'm talking about the Tulsa transfers. I know. I'm saying, like, why is he starting over them? Oh, uh, yeah. I, 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 I mean, we all know you have a personal vendetta against Ishmael Burdine anyway. But Well, it's valid. <laughs> well, and, you know, another, another thing that was frustrating, too, was – Kentucky's quarterback, Will Levis, and I'll admit, I totally underestimated him coming into this game. 
Uh, we hadn't really seen him do it yet against an opponent better than Louisiana Monroe, but he looked really good. Um, I mean, throwing the ball, a lot of it was Wandale Robinson, who was their uh, leading receiver tonight. He was everything that they, you know, pumped him up to be. He's what Mookie Cooper was supposed to be for Mizzou. I mean, I wish Mizzou had a Wandale Robinson. And uh, to be clear, I'm not saying Mookie Cooper can't be a good player or anything, but uh, he just, he certainly has not had that type of immediate impact. Um, but going back to Will Levis, he looked really good. And they mentioned on the broadcast, he has the build of an action figure and he can run you over. And there was one play and it was basically tonight in a nutshell where Will Levis just completely ran over Blaze Aldridge. Yeah, he was really frustrating to watch because he almost is in that. Uh, I mean, it's ironic because he transferred from Penn State, but he's kind of in that Trace McSorley mold where he can beat you with his arm. He can beat you with his speed, you know, uh, not really a pro style type guy, but definitely a deadly guy to face in college. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's definitely the type of quarterback you don't want to see at the college level. Man, this game was just fucking frustrating, dude. I, I'm i so tired of this, dude. Every year with Kentucky, like I was talking before the game even started, do you think this is a rivalry game? You know, I mean, I never viewed it as a rivalry game. It really should be. But honestly, you know what they say about rivalries. It can't be a rivalry if one side is winning almost every time. And exactly unfortunately that's been the case of missouri arkansas like we 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 are to kentucky like what arkansas is to us and i'm tired of it like yeah we beat them last year but when was the last time we beat them before that what like six years before that it's ridiculous yeah and it's close every time and mizzou just finds some way to blow it every single time and i'm tired of it like Kentucky, like they go, they went into this game and during this game talking like Kentucky is Alabama, that Kentucky is just this unstoppable football force that we would be, it would take a hand in act of God for us to even compete with them. And they're not. Kentucky is a mid-tier team in the SEC, just like us. We should be able to consistently beat them. They're not Alabama. This is ridiculous. And I'm tired and like, I like drink. I really do. And I want to believe that drink is the guy, but throughout leading up to this game, he was just talking about like how great of an opponent that Kentucky is and just basically preparing uh, the Missouri faithful for a loss. And I mean, I guess some people could consider that coach speak, but that doesn't sound like coach speak to me. That sounds like, cowardice to me and I don't know how he expected players to rally behind that and you could tell in the first half that it didn't happen in the second half I felt like there was a mentality of oh shit we could actually win this game so they turned on and actually played but in the entire first half the team looked so flat and uninspired and they were playing scared they they, they were no they were playing timid and it was kind of that way against LSU last year I feel like um If you remember, like at the very beginning, like they were kind of just toying around a little bit. And I don't think they really the players, they didn't look like they were playing like they felt like they had a chance to win that game. And then all of a sudden you look at the score at halftime and I think Missouri themselves is going, oh, crap, like we can actually win this game if we try now. And so they kind of make adjustments. They adjust the play calling on offense. And then you have a close game with a really good team. Um, And that was kind of the case tonight. But, I mean, it's not the result that we all wanted. And, yeah, I'm sick of being the little brother to Kentucky. That's not how it should be. This football is the sport that Mizzou should be dominating Kentucky. But, unfortunately, you have Barry Odom to thank for that because he dug us in such a deep hole that, I mean, it's embarrassing. And I will give Odom one thing. I won't say a lot of good things about Barry Odom, but one 
one thing that I will give him is that he got absolutely screwed in that uh, 2018 Mizzou Kentucky game with the phantom PI call that gave him the untimed down to win the game. Um, he they should have won that game. Actually, no, I take that back because guess what? Mizzou was playing. Barry Odom had them playing prevent defense, so I actually take that back. I was telling you during the or I tweeted it during the game, and then we talked about it afterwards. Lou Holtz used to say that if you're calling trick plays, you don't believe that you can win the game playing it normally. And that's what we were doing in the first half. There was all this cutesy bullshit that took forever to develop, and it didn't go anywhere. There were screen passes, a chance looper through a pass. There was just all this stupid bullshit that you call if you don't believe that you can win the game, like, one-on-one. But that's the and- thing, Connor, is that, like, I totally agree, and – it's become evident that Mizzou runs trick plays way more often than a capable team should, but yeah, they can't win normally. That's the reality is they can't. Here's the thing. This game was a touchdown game. Yeah. There was some like ridiculous crap that went our way, like the fumble on the goal line, uh, that weird pick, the blocked field goal, But at the end of the day, it was a touchdown game. If you don't call all that trick, cutesy bullshit, and you just play the game like you did in the second half, like uh, that two-minute drill, you probably win the game. Like, if you don't kill the drive with all that stupid crap, you can easily win that game. Well, before we get too far into the offense, and I, I do want to get back to that, I did want to talk about a few other things on the defense. Um, well, one of the things that also really frustrated me on the defense tonight was how many stupid penalties we had. And that was one thing I was starting to praise drink for last year was that we seemed to really limit the penalties and just really the dumb penalties. But, man, we had a lot of dumb penalties tonight. Um, I had the number in front of me, I think, uh, seven for 63 yards, unacceptable. And the amount that we had on defense for lining up off sides, embarrassing. Yeah, you, you can't do that. Like it's unacceptable. Like that's part of like what our criticism of Barry Odom when he here or when he was here is that the defense was just never disciplined whatsoever. And it's felt like the same crap today. Yeah. Also, um, Chris Abrams drain. He had some really nice plays. He recovered the blocked kick at the end of the game. He, uh, had a really nice uh, PBU earlier in the game. And then he also had some really bad plays. And uh, there was one point where it was that third and 12 towards the end that basically iced the game for Kentucky, almost iced the game. Uh, It was a deep pass to Wandale Robinson and he burned Chris Abrams drain, man. I love what we've seen from Abrams drain to this point but he's still, this is his first year playing corner and you have him on Kentucky's best offensive player in single coverage. To me, that was a little irresponsible. Um, also, Ennis Rakestraw, he went down with an injury tonight. I, it looks really bad uh, when they put the camera on him a sec- for a second before commercial, but I really hope he's okay. Yeah, that sucks to lose him, but... To be fair, like, he didn't do too much. So, no, so far the season he hasn't, but the potential he had coming in was really exciting. And now you lose a capable body in the secondary, and that's going to hurt, you know. I remember how well run. he played against Jalen Waddle his first ever game. I don't know what happened. It, well, the thing that I will give to Rakestraw is since he's gotten here, he's been asked to cover some of the best receivers in all of college football with zero experience. Now he has some experience going into his second year, but now he's being asked to adjust to a new defensive coordinator in his second year. Um, the rest of the defense isn't really giving him you know, much help. So Rakestraw has been put in a really tough spot and I kind of feel for him. 
Um, I, he's, he was better as a freshman, like with no experience whatsoever. And then like towards the end of his freshman season, his play started to decline and it just hasn't gotten better. And it's irresponsible to keep him in over Caleb Evans, but I will take him over ish. I will take him any day over ish, but I just wonder like, how he can get back to his early freshman performance, you know? Because, like, we were so high on him after that first Bama game when he looked good against – or at least competent against Jalen Waddle. It's hard to look good against Jalen Waddle, But he held his own. And I, I just don't know what happened to that player, you know? Well, he's still a young player, and he's got ways to go. So uh, I'm not – I'm not going to make a judgment on rake straw or anything, but I don't know. Do you have anything else to throw in about the defense? I mean, nah, the defense is just like, it just needs more talent. Yeah, no, I agree. And (coughs) excuse me, gosh, I'm coughing a lot this episode. Um, Really though, the defense also wasn't helped uh, by the fact that the offense, they will have, stretches of the game where they just fail to put together any long drives and it keeps the defense on the field and they get gassed and that doesn't help either. But the offense did have some really good moments too. They still put up 398 yards of total offense. The Kentucky defense had a hard time stopping them as well. Um, The offense was up and down. They put up 28 points. They, you know, like I said, it, it's really hard too when you have a defense that can't really stop anything either. It's, I mean, it just, it goes both ways. Um, But Mizzou, it's really remarkable that they were even in the game at the end. And it was because of the offense. I, I hope that this kind of wakes the team up and they don't feel sorry on themselves like they did in the first half in any more games. And, like, we talked about how this could be like that Tennessee game where late in the season we're sitting there going, man, I sure do wish we had that Kentucky game back, except mm-hmm. for this one felt a lot more in reach than that Tennessee game. Yeah, no, it 100% did. Man. We're definitely going to want this one back towards the end of the year, I feel like. And that sucks because, I, I mean, I really wanted to win this Kentucky game. I did. I wanted to win it so bad. It would have been great for our team's, you know, morale moving forward. Um, it, 2-0 and just looks so much better than 1-1. One and one. And then you would also be making up ground in the all-time series versus Kentucky. And now we have none of that. And it does hurt. Dude. Well, next week we play SEMO, and if we lose to SEMO, I'm not exaggerating. Drink better be fired the next day. But <laughs> yeah, no, they they have to beat SEMO. There's Barry no beat SEMO fifty nothing. So, <laughs> um, looking at some of the players in offense specifically, Connor Bay's lack tonight. 34 of 52 for 294 and four TDs. He had one interception. Um. Bazelak had another Bazelak game. There was some bad moments. There were some good moments, but he kept you in the game. He gave you some decent play. Um, He fought at the end there, too, when he was clearly hurt. Hopefully he'll be okay, too. Um, By the sounds of Drink's post-game presser, uh, he should be okay. And Drink would said, more importantly, he's going to be pissed off that Mizzou uh, lost, um, which you like to hear. Uh, you want to see your team's, you know, leader by example to be pissed off and visibly upset by losing a really important game. But Bazelak, he definitely missed some throws again. I was really frustrated. And look, it's a tough spot, and he was hurt towards the end of the game there. But there was the one Kentucky sack right before the last play of the game uh, on offense for Mizzou where – I mean, the player was right in front of Bazelak's face on his throwing side, and he made no attempt to dodge them whatsoever. And right there, you just knew that was the game. I don't even know if there was much he could have done there. Probably not, because really, 
the offensive line, they they gave no push uh, in the running game too. Tyler Beatty made the most of the rushing, you know, the blocking that uh, he was given in the rushing game, and we'll get to Tyler Beatty in a minute. But the offensive line was just completely overmatched on both sides of the line of scrimmage. Mizzou was overmatched, and that's really the story of tonight. It was the story of CMU, and it's probably going to be the story for the rest of the season. They just don't have the horses. God, I'm not looking forward to playing teams like Georgia. <laughs> Can we forfeit that one? <laughs> oh, God, this offensive line against Georgia. Yeah, it's not going to be a competition. Just take Bazelak out, man. I don't want him getting hurt. Put Jack Sampson in. <laughs> no, honestly, though, that's that's the type of game, like, I would love to see reps from, like, Tyler Macon or Brady Cook just to see what they look like. But that's... Well, yeah, you could probably stick Macon in there because he has the most mobility of the quarterback room and Georgia won't be expecting it, and you're not going to win the game anyway. So let's get crazy. Or just run some wildcat, maybe put Elijah Young back there, see what he does with that. That's the game where you whip out the trick plays like I was talking about earlier. Not Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, Honestly, though, like I said, Bazelak, he had another Bazelak type game, and he did some good things. And again, Mizzou got a lot of receivers involved tonight. Um, Tyler Beatty had 10 receptions for 88 yards. He was actually their leading receiver. Toski Dove looked really good, though. It made some tough catches, six for 65. Nico Hay, I'm impressed with Hay, man. Uh, he's getting more involved in the passing game as a tight end, and I really love to see it. Chance Looper, three for 27. Daniel Parker, he had two touchdown receptions tonight, which you also like to see. I like to see Drink utilizing the tight ends in the pass game, but he had three receptions for 21 yards. Dominic Lovett. Four receptions for 18 yards. Kiki Chisholm, only one for 17. I'm kind of disappointed in Kiki Chisholm so far. He also, he had that one grown man catch uh, uh, with the, where he got a touchdown during the two-minute drill at the end of the first half, but he had a lot of drops tonight as well, and I was disappointed because I want to see us get back that end-of-the-year Kiki Chisholm from last year. Mookie Cooper, one reception for 16 yards, and this is where I want to discuss Mookie Cooper a little bit more because – I feel like he should have more impact than that. And maybe he's still dealing with that injury, but man, like I said, Wandale Robinson for Kentucky is everything that Mizzou should have in Mookie Cooper, but we just haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Cooper hasn't done anything. He's like a crappy Debo Samuel. Okay. Well, I, I'm not, I don't want to make an indictment on Mookie Cooper or anything, but uh, I just, I, we haven't well, he's seen done that nothing except like these, Jet sweeps. He did run a route downfield once, and he he did have separation, but Bazelak just completely overthrew him. Yeah, that's the only time I can recall him running a route. He did have the one nice sweep that got us uh, first down, though. But that's pretty much it. Yeah, he had two carries for ten yards. Um, really though, the player that des- deserves the credit for keeping us in the game on offense is Tyler Brady. He just does everything. And there should be no doubt by now that he is a bell cow back. Uh, I I've seen the name starting to go around bailout Beatty. I've started saying it myself too, bailout Beatty. Cause it really goes on talked about how clutch this dude has come up time and time again to keep Mizzou in games. He single-handedly willed us back into that Arkansas game last year. And just anytime Mizzou needs a score, this dude just breaks off a long one. And, man, I love Tyler Beatty. He's a special player, and I've always been super high on him. Yeah. And I really wish Drink did more to get him involved last year, but ultimately that doesn't matter anymore. It's nice to see him get the touches that he's getting now. Um, but speaking of drink weights. I love Drinkwitz, and like you said, you know you want to love him, but I do have I, I I do have some concern with some of the play calls still, and a lot of it too is because the offensive line it doesn't give you a lot of flexibility with what you can do with this offense because you can hardly set anything up. But the continuous screens again were annoying tonight. Uh, the third down before the infamous fourth and four where we decided to punt where we shouldn't have. Uh, and he just ran Tyler Beatty to the left side of the line, knowing the offensive line was getting overmatched already. Um, that was such an uninspiring play call. 
you have to be more creative there and it may have cost us the game and I just really I'll just get into it now I really wish drink didn't punt the game I mean I mentioned it to you off air but uh tonight uh referencing the Kansas City Chiefs once again on this show uh if if you remember uh for those listening in 2019 the Chiefs started Matt Moore um for the Green Bay Packers game um, against Aaron Rodgers at Arrowhead. And towards the end of that game, late in the fourth quarter, the Chiefs needed a touchdown, I believe like a touchdown to either tie it or win. It was like fourth and three at half field. And Andy Reid decided to punt it back to Green Bay and bet on his defense. And everyone in that building knew and everyone watching that game knew that as soon as he did that, it would have backfired because Aaron Rodgers was not giving that ball back to Kansas city. I don't know why you would have been on your defense there because 2019 early 2019 chiefs defense was really bad. Like as bad as Mizzou was tonight. And I just don't understand why you bet on your defense in that scenario when you have a chance to tie or win the game. I understood the thought process just based on timing Like, even if we had scored there, like, I'm sitting there kind of looking at the clock, and I'm like, okay, if we score here, Kentucky has plenty of time to march down the field and score, right? And so the logic there was punt, and then a three and out one's the game, you know? And you're going to – you need a defensive stop anyway. So it made sense to me, but I understand, like, why you'd want to go for that. Yeah. Oh, well, and the part that's the most heartbreaking too is even after we decided not to punt and that whole thing went down, uh, we had another chance at the end of the game to win after blocking the field goal and still couldn't take advantage. And it's like a double heartbreaker. Um, also, it looked like Chris Abrams drain wanted to pick that thing up and take it to the house to tie the game up uh, when the field goal was blocked by Blaze Aldridge. But um he it took an awkward bounce, and I don't think he quite got to do what he wanted to do, which is unfortunate. It's kind of cool that we can block field goals, though. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It Maybe was fun Blaise when Aldridge it happened. can be our Shia McClellan. <laughs> By the way, Blaze Aldridge gets a lot of flack from the fans, too, and he is a little slow, and he'll get caught out of place. But the dude, it, he's, he's kind of become like the new Dan Sorensen for Mizzou. I like him. Like he just like he, he yes he does have a lot of screw ups, but he'll just make clutch plays when he the plays team with play. that dog mentality, bro. Okay, don't don't even just stop, <laughs> stop. We're not doing that this episode. Um, I don't know. There's not a whole lot more to break down, really. I just if I I came into this game like not really expecting Mizzou to win. Like I was optimistic with my prediction in our last episode, but I mean, if Mizzou had won this game, I feel like it would have been gravy. Like you would have been happy and you would have taken it no matter what the score was if Mizzou won. But uh, I'm happy with the way that they fought back to be quite honest. Again, that makes it sound like Kentucky is like this major football powerhouse. Like, yeah, if we beat them, it would be really cool, but I wasn't expecting it. Like, no, dude, we shouldn't be talking like this in <laughs> reference to Kentucky. I know. It just shows where we are as a program still, though. It's unfortunate. Oh, that's pathetic. I that think should be how we talk about Georgia. It's definitely a reality check, though. A lot of fans came into this season saying this team should, you know, they could win eight, nine, ten games. I don't – I just don't see it anymore. That doesn't change. We should have won this game. It was a one-score game. If the defense can improve marginally as the season goes on, Mizzou will still have some chance to win some games. Like Texas A&M, they looked horrible today. Mizzou, they could beat Texas A&M, especially because Texas A&M doesn't even have a good quarterback, and that's one of the most important things. Um, And that's why Kentucky also won tonight is because Will Levis is a player. He's a good QB. That's why okay, I... let's look at the remainder of the schedule and like how these teams are playing right now. Sure. SEMO should be an easy win. Boston College, I assume that's a toss up. That game. I, th- I think it's I, a toss up, but let's say Missouri. I know wins. nothing about Boston College. They're a good uh, program. Tennessee should win that. North Texas, 
better win that. We're going to that one. <laughs> Texas A&M, you just said they look terrible. Vanderbilt just took the lead over Colorado State, but otherwise has looked awful. They got blown out by East Tennessee State. Uh, Georgia, not winning that one. South Carolina, they're, they aren't good. Florida, probably not winning that one. No. And then Arkansas. Better, better win Arkansas. that one. You better win that one. Like, you can lose the rest. You better beat Arkansas. Yeah. So, okay. I'm looking at it again. So, uh, should beat SEMO. That's two wins. Boston College, let's say they win. That's three wins. Tennessee, four wins. North Texas, five wins. Texas A&M. Mizzou has a chance to beat Texas A&M. Let's say they lose, though, just to keep it fair. That's five and two. Um, Vanderbilt, that's your sixth win. You're six and two. Georgia's a loss, six and three. South Carolina, probably win that one. Seven and three. Florida's a loss, seven and four. Arkansas, they beat Arkansas five years in a row. Let's make it six. Eight and four year. I mean, I'll take I, it. That's probably your best case scenario at this point, I feel like. Uh, I say that best case scenario, you win that Texas A&M game too. Make it nine and three. Gosh, so yeah, we could still be looking at nine and three. I don't think that's too much out of the realm of possibility. It's not, but I feel like somewhere in there along the way, there's going to be a game that they lose that they shouldn't have lost. Yeah, typical Mizzou. Yeah, it's just, I mean, again, it's a reality check. Fans have to temper their expectations. It's just where Mizzou's at as a program right now. They don't add the horses yet, but Drinkwitz is working on it. Look at the recruiting class he's assembling right now for the class of 2022. It's ranked in the top 20. He just raked in a top 20, top 25 class last year, highest rated in school history. Just give him time. I mean, I don't know how many times we have to say it in our episodes. Yeah, it's pretty much going to be the same story for like the next year and a half. Yeah. Well, I hope they show improvement, though. Um, the defense, they've, they've got to improve if Mizzou hopes to win any more games. Because Well, they can't get much worse, can they? <laughs> no, I guess you're right. It's like the Kansas football program. Well, they only have one direction. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Is there anything else that you had to say about this game? Not really. On to SEMO, I suppose. Yeah, well, that should be a good bounce back game to boost the team's morale a little bit. So. I should hope. Yeah, he, he, you if have it's to be. Not, there's a lot bigger issues. <laughs> then, okay, if we lose the SEMO, then you'll get me on the fire Steve Wilkes train, maybe. No, if we lose to SEMO, it's time to fire Drake. Like, that's <laughs> unacceptable. Yeah. Um, that's all for today, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Um, that's all I got for today though. So we'll catch you guys after the next one. Peace.